Welcome to the event, everybody. This is going to be a fun one. Um, you are going to come out of this webinar with a good grab bag of sales messaging techniques and principles and frameworks that are going to help you inject a tremendous amount of urgency into your deals. And I couldn't be more excited about who I'm talking about with this. So we've got Kyle Bastian. I'm going to see if I can orient myself around this deck first of all. Here we go. Kyle Bastian. So I'm going to say a bunch of stuff about Kyle that I know he wouldn't say about himself. Oh, uh, so I've gotten to know Kyle, I think, over the last year and a half, maybe even two years, back when he was director of sales training and enablement over at a company called Copper. Mm -hmm. And he has proven himself to be just a tremendous sales enablement leader, sales leader. And I would I would argue, I don't know if he would say this, but I would argue product marketing leader as well. He is very good at coming up with just crisp, punchy messaging that really gets through to buyers and helps them uh, come across the finish line here. And he has a long track record of a lot of different sales leadership roles to bring just a rich perspective to the conversation we're going to be having today about sales messaging. And then, of course, we've got myself here. I won't spend a lot of time introducing me. I would assume a lot of the people on this webinar know who I am because you guys probably registered through our email list. Um, but just the short story, I'm Senior Director of Product Marketing over at Gong. I've uh, been here for about three years and really, really loving it. And we're going to talk about our perspective on rolling out messaging, both from my perspective as a product marketing leader and previous sales person and sales leader, and Kyle's perspective as, as a sales enablement leader, a sales trainer, and the other roles that he's held throughout his career. So really quick, stay tuned for the very tippy top end of the webinar. We've got an awesome giveaway that we're giving away totally for free for every or for anybody who registers for the signup. It's going to be a version of our sales deck that we use at Gong that's based on pretty much all of the principles that we're gonna be talking about today. Because what you're gonna learn during this webinar is a lot of powerful principles, but a lot of them need to be pulled down to earth, okay? You need to understand what does this actually look like as far as examples go. And of course, we're gonna give you a lot of examples throughout this entire webinar, but at the end, we're gonna give away our deck so that you can see how all of these principles come together and materialize like as a sales deck. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I am excited to have this conversation. The best message today wins, okay? This is not, this has not always been the case. Today in business, the best message or the best story is what wins markets. And a big reason for that is because there are so many products in every category today. So if you look at MarTech, just as one example, which is something, you know, Kyle's going to talk about a little bit later, there are between five and five, Five and 7,000 MarTech vendors, like marketing technology software vendors. There used to be much fewer, and when there were fewer in each category, you could rely on just a really good product to win. But now, because there's so much competition and choice and noise in pretty much every category, it's really the messages and the story that cut through the clutter and win markets over the long term. One example of that is Zora. So Zora is not the only subscription billing company out there. There are plenty of other competitors, but they have won the unfair share of the market, the lion's share of the wealth. They're the market leader because of the story that they have told to the market over a period of like five or seven years. It's the subscription economy. Okay, their entire company has really rallied around that instead of talking about you know, product features like billing and that kind of stuff. Uh, Drift is another example, and Kyle, I would love to hear your perspective on Drift and your story and your messaging here. Yeah, for sure. And Chris, also, thank you for the extremely warm introduction and, and maybe undeserved, but I appreciate it anyway. Um, and I'm also not letting you get off that easy. I mean, you guys all know Chris. This guy goes by the professor. And uh, and on this topic, Chris, like I actually, we met, uh, we met a few years ago, and I had reached out to you because I read one of your first Gong Labs articles when you guys were breaking down the company story itself. And you were talking about how if it's longer than, if it's like the trophy case company story of like the funding you've received and uh, the amount of years you've been in business and the clients that you've won that people like check out after like two minutes. 
Yep. Um, and I remember I read that. I reached out to you to ask how you were you were coming up with this stuff because uh, it was gold. And then I started Lots training on that years ago. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we actually met over a conversation around this very topic a few years ago. So I'm glad to be back here talking about it with you guys again. Yeah, um, and Drift seems to be winning the unfair share of their market with this story that you guys are going to market with. So that's a great point. This, the thing about this, we're going to talk about how to create this narrative and these stories. Like basically what we're going to talk about is like the company story, you know, only it's it's going to replace, you know, the first 10 slides of your enterprise pitch deck and, and, and that kind of stuff, which I would argue nobody, customers don't care about, doesn't do anything for them, but the far more compelling and foundational idea of um of kind of like raising stakes and um and yep. and how to kind of and and where you fit in that right um and so yeah you talked about you know zuora kind of like creating this stuff um i'll talk about drift in a minute i think this whole thing though is just so foundational because this isn't just how to pitch better it, it's actually like how your company is going to succeed like the story that you tell the market needs to be the same story that your founders tell your investors, that you tell your employees when you're hiring them. Um, this is rooted in a lot of crazy research that's talked about in um, in Sapiens, right? And and uh, they talk about Dunbar's number of 150, over which that's the amount of people that you can have like personal relationships with and have mm. ties of community. And anything over that, uh, societies tend to like splinter and break down. And then maybe this has happened at companies before. Um, like Chris, you, uh, how many employees at the company you worked at before Gong? The the company I worked at before yeah. Gong. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a couple companies ago because before that was a startup that I was running, but it was InsideSales.com, and I think we were at probably six or seven hundred employees when we left. And just a quick anecdote about Dunbar's principle before mm -hmm. I pass the torch back over to you: as we were approaching 150 employees at Gong, this was. Um, maybe nine months ago or so, our CEO got all of us executives in a room over the course of weeks. You know, we didn't just get this done in one meeting. And we defined our company operating principles. And the reason we decided to define those company operating principles then instead of any other point in our history is because we were approaching that 150 number. And if we didn't define that stuff before we got to 150, things would start to break down and people wouldn't have guidelines for decision making. So not really the topic we're talking about now, but since you talked about Dunbar's principle, uh, I've been burning to talk about that ever since. I know, man. And well, and here's the thing is like I, I've uh, I've been at a. Um... I've been at a couple companies. I've been at a uh, a company that got purchased by Intuit, and I stayed there for a few years. So, like a twenty billion dollar public company. I've been through three companies now uh, while they crossed over that one hundred and fifty number, and I, I bring it up because I think it relates so much to this topic, because the the success with which those companies made that transition it directly related to the consistency and the credibility with which they told this story or this narrative about the business. So uh, we're gonna talk about how to build this story in a way that helps you in a sales context, but I want you to keep in mind what this helps, like like what how this applies to just like the, the how it applies to your company as a whole. Um, yep. Because I think this is foundational and like I've come to believe that this is literally the difference between companies that make it through that transition smoothly or relatively smoothly and those that don't. So this is, this is critical stuff. You're right. Um, You're right. So yeah, so as it relates to to drift, you know, we've got a pretty interesting story. Like we look at a few things. So we we point out forms, and this is like we look at forms, and forms, frankly, aren't the enemy. They're just like the most obvious symptom um, of what's happening. And what we see happening is that uh, there's kind of three different consumer behaviors that are taking place right now that are combining to really change the dynamic in B two B sales. And those are things like uh, G2 crowd and Gartner and basically this prevalence of information that customers can get and research on their own. Now that that's not new. That's been around for a long time. We have this, uh, this, you know, explosion of competition that you mentioned, like that MarTech slide that Chieftain puts out that has 7,000 MarTech businesses on there in which we compete. Um, and then the last one of our favorite consumer apps, like, you know, Netflix and, and, uh, Uber, uh, Spotify, even Amazon that have created this expectation of now um, and getting what you want immediately uh, amongst consumers. And consumers don't act any differently when they go to work. You know, they're starting to expect that more and more now. But if you look at what our 
B2B sales and, and business processes look like, you know, there's inbound SDRs that qualify leads um, to prevent people who wanted to talk to sales from talking to sales, which is which is crazy, right? Like we put friction in these processes all over the place um, because we're trying to sell more, we're trying to protect our own business interests and we're not making it easy to buy. And it's that disconnect that I think explains some of the numbers that you see in B2B sales right now, where we're spending $5.1 billion a year on paid advertisements and it's only converting uh, on landing pages at 2.3% of the time, right? Now that's objectively terrible, but it's something that we as a bit, as an industry have accepted because we're benchmarking you know, our, our, our peer groups and other companies and, and that's what everybody is dealing with. So it's something that we've come to accept, right? Um, so, you know, we've taken the, the, we've realized that like the way to make it, if we're gonna use as the top design cue, how do I make it easy for people to buy from us? then we have to have more conversations with them and remove the friction to those conversations. And so it's that idea that Drift has been founded on um, and forums just represent, you know, like, a, um, well, a, a convenient like poster to saying. make the point in this case, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, you in the audience, I want you to notice a few things that Kyle said as he was talking about how Drift approaches messaging. He was talking about trends that are out there in the marketplace. They have nothing to do with Drift or Drift's products. There are trends out in the marketing or marketplace about how buyers worlds are changing and their buyer habits are changing and they're becoming more powerful and if those types of trends threaten drifts potential customer status quo we're going to come back to that toward the middle of this webinar and talk about how you can come up with your own version of that a couple other examples of narratives that win markets are gong's three pillars of revenue success you know up leveling the perception of what gong is which you know, people used to think it was just this call recording tool with a few be bells and whistles. Um, this is another example of a company narrative. And one more before we actually get down to the brass tacks of actually how do you do this stuff and how do you come up with your own is the iPod. So iPod was not the first MP3 or MP3 player on the market. And I know this is an older example. This is 15 or 20 years back at this point. But there were tons of MP3 players. They were all competing on features and storage. And I don't even know. It's been a while. I mean, 15 or 20 years. Uh, and then Steve Jobs comes out with this just single, or not single, but small story. It's like five words, 1,000 songs in your pocket. And that just stole the market. They repeated that message over time and they won the market, even though there were plenty of other competitors out there. So if you come up with your own narrative like this that can be used both in the brass tacks of the sales trenches and as high level as an investor pitch or uh, what your product marketing people say to analysts, it's going to be game over as long as you repeat that message over a very long period of time. So a couple Great. quick stats to kind of just frame up the current state of messaging in most companies is this is how executive level sales leaders feel about sales messaging today. Okay, so 10% of them feel that sales calls or 10% of sales calls are not valuable enough or only 10% of sales calls are valuable enough to uh, warrant the time they spend on them. And only 7% of executives would uh, agree to a follow-up meeting based on the content of that sales call. In other words, uncompelling messaging tends to happen in most sales calls. And Kyle, I know you can speak a little bit more to this stat than I can, so I'll pass the torch back to you. Yeah, I've run these numbers at a couple places, and I think if the the stat is that like sixty like. 68% of your deals aren't even being lost. Like if you don't win a deal and you look at the loss reasons, almost two thirds of them are gonna be lost to either like no decision or went dark. And then when you follow up with those went darks, like three to six months later, you found out they actually didn't go with the competitive solution. Yeah. So I interpret they this as nothing. like, you're not, yeah, you're not losing deals. You're just, you're not winning them either, you know? Um, and like, and, and I think this, I'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this later, like the dynamic at play, especially the the not now, right? Like when people like continuously punt close dates month over month over month. Um, you show this stat, any of the sales leaders out there, any of the people on the floor, and you're going to get like, oh my God, yes, it's it's literally probably the worst part of their job. And I think with the, the what's not shown here is that these deals, unfortunately, are often the ones that people spend the most amount of time on. Right. And I, I'll try not to like bro out and bring in too many sports or like poker analogies here, but there's this idea in, in poker that the person who finished second was the one who folded first. 
And so the idea with this game over strategy is that you'd rather like take a bold stance at the beginning of the process and have them be like, look, I don't see it that way. Or I, I completely disagree with your take on the market and like end the process right there. Then you know, spend months and hours and and uh, and tons of time and investment on on a deal where somebody's just like fundamentally not going to agree with like the story, the premise on what you're doing. Um, another, so you'd rather lose the deal quickly than or than lose it slowly, you know. Yeah, another thing I want the audience just to keep in mind as you've been talking is notice you didn't use the word polarizing, but the description of your messaging implies that it should be polarizing. And we're yeah. going to talk about why that is and how to come up with your own, which is uh, part of one of the first techniques here, which we can get into, which is called start with a nexus. Okay, start your messaging with a nexus. This is your first mm -hmm. grab bag of messaging techniques and principles that you can put to use hopefully pretty soon here. And before we define what a nexus is, we're going to define why you need a nexus. And Kyle, I know you have some thoughts about um, what we're looking at here on this slide. Do you want to maybe voice over this one? Yeah, this is so a lot of this is like a lot of these ideas are in like perspective selling methodologies and like challenger being like the most prominent one. But uh, but this is a concept from uh, force management, actually, which is you get relegated to the level of the person that you sound like. You know, so I'll, I'll use Drift as an example. You know, we we've been guilty of this, of like calling people and being like, hey, how can I like I, I want to tell you about how Drift could, you know, improve your lead conversion rates. Mm -hmm. So if you send that kind of message to a CMO, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, here, talk to our junior demand gen person. They're the one who own that KPI. Right. Yep. But if you're yep. talking about something different, right, if you're talking about like like trend, if you want to talk about benchmarking trends on where the market's going like that kind of stuff tends to be more like c level clickbait you know they're going to take they're going to take calls if we're going to talk about that right if we're going to talk about that level that's appropriate to the person you're talking to so think about like what your messaging is and if it's too if it's about a kpi or it's about a number you're going to talk to the person who owns that number you know and if it's about something bigger like the future like the exist like the, the the existential threat to a business you know that's something that a cmo or a c-level executive in your deal is gonna you know perk their ears to yeah and i would also argue the opposite is true if you go to somebody who's kind of like mid-level you've been trying to get this to the senior executive but just haven't heard back and you go to somebody mid-level and you come to them with this really C-level senior executive sounding message. In some yep. cases, they're gonna punt you upward because maybe they're gonna look good to their boss. Not every time, but the, the mm -hmm. principle we're looking at here on the screen actually applies both ways. You'll get punted down and you'll get punted up depending on who you sound like and who you're talking to. And I yep. know you guys um, had some interesting stats specific at Drift. Um, you know, I won't steal yeah. your thunder there. Want to talk about no this no right you're now. absolutely right yeah we i mean we've we've looked at this in our business so if if you know the previous point is about like how to talk to get the 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 c level in the room um this is the financial case for that you know and we've even witnessed in our business that our asp in in our in our uh um ideal customer profile segments is 2x when the cmo is involved and the deals close 30 days faster when we're having this conversation, when we're talking about the game over strategy, um, the financial uh, impacts are huge um, for our business and I would argue for anyone else's. All right, so now that we've framed up the problem that a Nexus solves, which is getting you squared away with the C-level executive, let's talk about exactly what a Nexus is. And I have a quick mm -hmm. call to action for everybody in the audience. I would suggest you screenshot this screen that you're looking at here so you have this on hand. Of course, we're going to send this out after the webinar is over and you'll have it, but I would recommend screenshotting it so it's on your desktop. So a nexus is the beginning of your narrative. It's the beginning of your message, and it is a polarizing insight that changes how your customer thinks or feels about either the problem you solve or the opportunity that you help them exploit. Yep. Okay, it's not quite the same thing as like a challenger sale reframe. A challenger right. sale reframe is a type of nexus. A nexus can be a little bit broader than that. So I'm gonna walk you through a few examples of some nexuses, if that's the plural form of the world, maybe maybe it's nexi, uh, that, that really worked. And the first one I'm gonna talk about, the product is a book, okay? The book is called The Power of Full Engagement. And this is a book on productivity. And the nexus the authors came up with to sell this book is they said it was an insight. They said productivity 
like professional productivity mm -hmm. is not about time management, which is what everybody thinks it is. It's not about time management. It's about energy management. And in the book, they talk about managing your energy and your circadian rhythms and working in 90 minute blocks and taking 30 minute breaks and repeating that throughout the entire day. And the point isn't that you should, I'm not trying to give a lesson on productivity here. The point is this book, when it came out, which was, you know, 15 years ago or, or so, cut through the clutter of productivity books by saying, everybody's talking about how time management is the key to productivity. And we're here to say that it's only a tiny part of the pie. The bigger piece to the puzzle is energy management. So that was the nexus. It reframed how people were thinking about the problem which is productivity. And the reframe is from time management to energy management, which is what we're looking at here, going from managing time to managing energy. Life is a marathon versus life is a series of short sprints where you exert and recover and exert and recover. Now, Drift has their own nexus. We're gonna give you a few examples of what a good nexus sounds like. I've given you one. We've got a couple more to cover. Kyle, do you wanna talk, talk about Drift's nexus? Yeah, so you know, this is on our website right now. This is we've been talking about this for for a few years here at Drift. And the way I think of a Nexus, like I'll tell you a, a quick story if you'll indulge me, Chris. When I was a kid, I didn't. I need glasses. I'm wearing contacts right now, and I'm nearsighted, right? I didn't know that uh, until I was 20 years old. When I got my first set of glasses, and until then, I thought that's just how everybody saw. I didn't. I couldn't see through other people's eyes, so I didn't realize my vision was poor. Um, and then I finally was was you know, diagnosed nearsighted. I got my first set of contacts. I put the glasses on and I was like, you're kidding me. This is how you guys all see. Everybody sees like this. I'm like, oh my God. I was like, well, you guys are screwed now, you know, because I've been doing all right with like blurry vision. And now that I got this on, like it, it's game over. Right. And so I remember having that, that, that hilarious feeling. And so I think of a nexus as having that same effect for your prospect. Like I literally envision putting fresh glasses on somebody and there and it doesn't change their problem it just changes the way they view it to where like everything comes into focus um and this is also a strategy that was talked about years before challenger in a book called blue ocean strategy it's the same idea of like shifting evaluation criteria to like places that are more favorable for you to compete and so in drifts you know you see on the on the left hand side you know, kind of like a, a traditional um inbound marketing uh you know made made popular in like 2007, 2008, around like driving, how to drive traffic to your websites and things like that. Um, and then the new way is, is kind of like skipping a lot of these steps and actually removing certain tranches of your entire funnel. Um, and like if you have, you know, a form and then you have an MQL and then you have a meeting, then you have an opportunity, like we might be able to skip a good two of those and just have somebody go from website visitor to opportunity um, in real time in a matter of minutes. Um, so it's easy. It, the note on this though is like a lot of websites have these. A lot of companies have kind of an old way, new way uh, graphic, like what you see here. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people are going to get that the new way is cool. I think what we'll talk about in a little bit here is a lot of companies make the mistake of not focusing enough on the problems with the old way, yep. right? Like yep. not not then um, really spending the majority of your time. You, you know, you got to tear down old way you know, before anyone's receptive to new way. And, and yep. I think that's a key part of this entire idea here. Absolutely. Okay. So the goal of the Nexus is to shake their confidence. Once they put on these new lens or lenses that Kyle's been talking about, um, it should shake them a little bit in a good way. And I want to expand on that thought and talk about a few attributes of a good Nexus. And if you have been compelled by this idea of a nexus if you're really kind of leaning into your seat right now everybody listening this is another slide that i would take a screenshot of because it's going to help you come up with your own nexus so the first one we covered it changes how your buyer thinks about the problem you solve or the opportunity you help them exploit it shakes their confidence meaning they're they're, they're not as certain about how to achieve their goals because they thought one path would get there and now you're introducing a totally counter, a new path that is counterintuitive to them. It's polarizing. Kyle talked about this without using the word polarizing a little bit earlier where you come in bold and you take a stance. Now, what I would say is that if you have your nexus right, roughly speaking, 80% of the people in your market are going to emphatically agree with that nexus and they're gonna love you for it. And 20% of the people 
not only are it's not going to resonate with them, but they might disagree and even hate you for it. Okay, it's got to be a polarizing communication. Now, you got to make sure you have that ratio right. You don't want 50% of the people hating you. But if you can get around 80, 20, where 80% of the people totally agree and 20% of the people are kind of like, no, you're full of shit and here's why, you might be onto something. Okay, not for sure, but it might be a sign that you're onto something. And then yeah. the fourth attribute of an effective ne nexus is it's a clear binary statement. I'll give you an example. When we are selling, when we at Gong are selling to companies in highly competitive markets, the nexus we talk about is product differentiation is dead. Today you win with how you sell, not what you sell. Now that is clear black and white binary. Here's a bad example of how to deliver that. Product differentiation doesn't quite work as well as it used to. Maybe in some cases it works, but not as well as it used to. And today, sales conversations are a little more effective than product differentiation. The meaning behind both of those two statements, the first one I did and then the one I just delivered, is identical. But the second one is fluffy. It's not binary. It's not clear. The first one was clear. Okay, It's product differentiation is dead. Today you win with how you sell, not what you sell. Now, Kyle's going to take us through a quick exercise, just kind of a thinking exercise of how to come up with your own nexus. So, Kyle, over to you. Yeah, so um, there's an analogy here with, like, there's common expressions that people use all the time. I don't know if you're, you ever geek out. I do this sometimes, just if I can admit this, we're in the trust tree with the branches. I sometimes, like, look up the origin of just, like, common expressions that I have no idea what they mean, you know what I mean, or where they came from. And what you find when you do that is that oftentimes those expressions are used today in, in, in 180 degree different usage than how they were initially coined. So I'll give you an example. You guys have all heard the expression like jack of all trades, master of none. Um, it's used usually derisively to talk about uh, you know someone being a generalist or in like a, I mean, I've used that in competitive positioning to say like, you know, hey, we're best in breed and they're a one-stop shop, right? And, yep. and it's a good turn of a phrase. That phrase initially, the full sentence is jack of all trades, master of none, but better than a master of one. And it's meant to praise people who have well-rounded skill sets in a variety of different areas and somebody who only knows a lot about one thing. So the initial usage of that phrase is was actually 180 degree different than how it's used today. Interesting. I didn't know so, that. Fascinating, right? I, I had to stop using it once I learned what it meant because I was using it completely wrong um, <laughs> and, and just basically bastardizing the quote. So the... The analogy is to study the origin of prevailing wisdom. So if you want to look at like the your first step to coming up with your own nexus, if, if you look at something that doesn't make sense in an industry, look at the uh, the history of that prevailing wisdom. And you can usually trace it back to probably a book that like popularized a business concept around something and read that book and then research the business context in which it was written and think about what has changed about those conditions what was happening at the time that is no longer happening now and that's a very clean way to come up with your own nexus and i and i did this when i started at drift right because you know the the old way is something that we still do at drift we do all the things that like we have you know we do content marketing right like we do think of our website as like a hub and some of the foundational ideas of of SEO and driving traffic to the site and inbound marketing was was popularized by HubSpot that built a business out of it. And then they wrote a book on it called Inbound Marketing. And, and we wrote a book called Conversational Marketing. So I read Inbound Marketing first to better understand, like if we're saying this is the old way and this is the new way, I better understand the old way intimately. And what I learned there was that we're not even really um, tearing down the old way so much as building on it to reflect the change in consumer behavior if that makes sense, right? So if you can find the origin of the old way and understand that thoroughly, then you'll be able to then think about what's different and you can have you can build your nexus around that set of circumstances. Amazing. And again, audience, please take a screenshot of this one. You know, go back, think through these questions on your own and come up with some answers. I'll leave that for another three, two, one, and now we are moving on. So the nexus, um, that is clearly a messaging technique that we could talk about for an entire webinar, but we got to move on because mm -hmm. we promised you guys a bunch of 
messaging technique. So now let's get into technique number two, which is introduce a threat to their status quo. So Kyle, do you want a voice over loss aversion real quick? Yeah, this is an irrational bias. This, um, this was discovered by um, a guy named Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. They wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which is the best marketing book I've ever read. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tomb. It's about decades of psychological research. But you'll learn more about human biases and, um, uh, and how to market and how to people act, how people behave than any book I've ever read. So a huge mm -hmm. plug for that book. And, and they were the first ones to identify this idea of loss aversion, which is people will react, will, will act uh, more or they will feel deeply losses more than they will feel wins of the same magnitude. So mm -hmm. if, you were, if you have $100 and you lose it, you know, you will be far more upset than if you, you know, had a hundred dollars and got another hundred dollars, or if you had zero dollars and made a hundred dollars. So that's the yep. idea here. I think the implication in, in marketing um, is, uh, uh, it, it, well, I think there's obvious implications in your messaging, right? And I thought about this beforehand, like, like we sold this webinar even as like, you know, come talk to to Kyle and Chris, we'll tell you how to double your conversion rates. You know, if we had titled this webinar like. Hey, we'll show you how to create a story that will keep you relevant or something like that, like that will keep you from losing relevancy in your market, right? Like, I, mean, I don't know, maybe we would have had more attendees or something, right? But if you, there, any message that you can craft as like what you're going to get out of it on the positive side, think about how you can craft it as like as, as, as preventing you from losing something or FOMO is a popular technique that you can use around this. Like you are going to yep. miss something, you know what I mean, which, which plays on loss aversion. Um, if you don't, you know, do this act or, or participate in this thing. Right. There's a story that illustrates loss aversion really nicely, which is the CEO of a financial services company was giving a speech to his, you know, army of financial advisors. And it was the story of how to call a millionaire at 5 a.m. in the, you know, five in the morning and have her thank you for it. And it was, the story goes like this. If you call a millionaire at 5 a.m., and you tell her, I can help you make, I can help you gain $20,000 today, but you have to hang up or you have to act right now. She is going to curse you out and hang up the phone. However, if you call that same millionaire at 5 a.m. and you say, I can prevent you from losing $20,000, but you have to act right now, she's going to graciously thank you. Same amount of money framed in a different perspective. One's about gaining. And she doesn't care about that. And one is about not losing. And she desperately cares about that. Now, Kyle, I know you, uh, we talked, you know, when we prepared for this webinar, you had a story about, I can't remember what words you use. It was like something about interpreting the status quo or a different sequence of events. Do you want to share your yeah. thinking on that? Am I on, okay? Yeah, I remind yeah, you. Yeah, well, so, yeah. There's, there's ideas here, right? It's like so. So you're like this is basically what sales is. Like you're taking somebody from an A state to a B state. Like that's what we're doing when you're introducing a new product, especially if it's if it's disruptive. So everybody wants to talk about their point B, which is what life is like with your product, and and customers are like super down to agree. They are all about it, you know. And like the easiest bridge to cross in any sales cycle is people that think your product's cool or that it does what you say it's going to do. That's not why you're winning or losing deals. If I go back to that 68% number on deals that they can't agree on what to do, this is what we're talking about. And what it is, is you did not spend enough time tearing down point A, right? And the thing about it is in every business, there's a certain level of dysfunction internally, frankly, which is just people who can't agree on what they should be working on. And people who own different parts of the business have different perspectives on what the priorities ought to be. So if you want to get your deals done faster, this is what happens. You have to tear down that A point for every single person and point them at the same B point, right? So the, the, whenever I talk about this with folks, especially you know salespeople that are earlier in their career, they're like, that sounds great, Kyle. I'd love to tell everybody I talk to that they're doing it wrong, uh, but you know, I'm 27 years old and I've been doing this for two years and I'm talking to you know, somebody who is a VP, C-level, has been in the role for 20 years and has like vastly more experience at this than I do. So like, what right do I have to even stake this claim? Um, and and do they, are they even right, you know? And so my answer to that is I, I think about this, um, this study that was talked about in the uh, Mark Manson's book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which is fantastic. And he talks about this study of folks who were put in a room and there's a light and a keyboard and they're told to figure out the sequence of events that makes the light go on. 
And so they start typing away and the light goes on. They try to replicate it. Um, eventually people start like messing around in their chairs. Some people stand up, some people sit down. After uh, a certain period of time, everybody leaves believing that they figured out the sequence of events that makes the light turn on. Um, what they don't know is that the light goes on and off randomly throughout the experiment. So this illustrates that humans are basically little meaning making machines, right? Like we go through our lives creating narratives that are not true, you know, to explain things that don't even really happen to us. And though th this happens in business, you know, like things happen and people, you know, create false positives and false negatives all the time because something else unrelated was happening at the same time that they attributed to this business event or this outcome. So my point is that a lot of people are going to be uh, having assumptions around the way their, their business works. These are basically, point A is just a mental model for how things operate that are not necessarily informed by objective data. So if you pick at that and you bring the heat on this, then you're gonna have more success than you think in changing people's point of views around the narrative of how their business or how their role in it works. Mm. Now here's a quick example of a pitch that really does tear apart, tear apart point A before introducing point B. And this example comes from Corporate Visions and my friend Tim Reister, who wrote a book called Conversations That Win the Complex Sale really solid book. Um, he's talking about an example of a salesperson selling formaldehyde free furniture. Okay, the first salesperson just pitches its benefits, it's greener, it's safer for the environment, yada yada, nobody buys. The great salesperson introduces a threat to the status quo. It's like an external trend that's threatening the retailer status quo before introducing the formaldehyde free furniture. He says, American citizens are becoming more health conscious and wary of dangerous chemicals. So that's trend number one. In fact, Google search volume for formaldehyde free furniture is up 600% in two years. Okay, now we're attaching numbers to this uh, trend that's threatening the status quo. We help retailers make good on this opportunity by supplying formaldehyde free furniture massively more, and this is a very simplistic example of the pitch, massively more compelling than spewing off a bunch of benefits about formaldehyde free furniture and how it's safer or greener or whatever the benefits are. Okay, technique number three is invoke self-discovery. Okay, invoke self-discovery is about telling a familiar painful story that your buyer can see him or herself in as you tell that story. So Kyle, I know you, you have some thoughts about this one. I also have some thoughts about this one as far as sobriety groups being really, really good at this and helping their, you know, quote unquote, um, potential market come to their own self-discovery. I would love to add my thoughts after you first give yours. Yeah, for sure. So this is the idea of like, um, you got to make this real, right? Because like to this point, we've, you know, introduced a, a, a shocking nexus. You know, we've we've dropped some knowledge around some facts around it. We've like made the case, but now you gotta, you gotta make it real. Right. And so I've got, you know, you, you know me, Chris, right? Like I've, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of history with drug and alcohol abuse. I'm, I'm sober and I spend a lot of time hanging out with people that are also keen to stay sober. And, uh, my experience with that was that if you had told me, and this is a, a perfect example of this, right? Like if you had told me what I needed to do or what I should do, or, uh, or, or tried to sell me any kind of solution around that. Like when I was, you know, active in the disease, I mm -hmm. didn't want to hear that. I mean, it's not even theoretical. People did that, right? Like, you know, my wife, like people, my family, friends, like I had a lot of people talking to me about the consequences of my actions in that experience. And um, the, I just want to inter interject real quick. The yeah. reason you were resistant to that is because you, you had a state of mind that starts with a D. Do you know what word I'm looking for? No, no, no. what are you getting at? Denial, denial, which is oh, yeah. Well, similar... not even, yeah, I don't even know if it was that it was it, it's like, I mean, I would like, yeah, you're right. But I, I just didn't want to, you know, it's like kind of like, screw you. Don't tell me what to do. You know, it was yep. more <laughs> it was more more of that. Uh, I was like, yeah, you're probably which right. Helped, but, you know, I don't want to hear it. You know? Yeah, this yeah. this is like the yeah. Sorry. Well, I keep so like, the, so like whenever you, whenever people share their experience around this, it's always like, look, man, this is what I was like, you know, and, and what finally helped me get sober was, was just having one person uh, tell me like, look, this is what it was like for me. And they told my story. And like, they, it wasn't like, 
like I did this, I did that. I was like, I felt this way, you know, and I thought this way. And it was stuff that you might otherwise be embarrassed to say out loud, you know, mm. but if you can, if you're brave enough to say the things that everybody thinks, but are embarrassed to, to think or judge themselves for thinking, um, then you almost always find people who say, dude, yeah, I actually feel exactly that way, you know? And then it's like, and, and now it's like, okay, you have my attention. Like that is how I'm thinking about it. Um, and then, you know, they share, it's like, this is what I was like, this is what happened. This was like the, the crisis point, right. That how I, how I, you know, found the willingness to get help around this. And then this is what it's like now. And it's like, you know, and if you, if you want that, you know, then I can show you what I did to get it, you know, and like, that's, that's it. That's the entire deal, you know? And, and there's, there's so many, like, I, I, I feel like I could talk about this subject for a long time. Um, because I find like, there's so many parallels between like the most effective way to sell and this kind of messaging where like, if you, if you, it's like, look, man, like this is just the, the, the way the world works this is how I thought about it before I, I started doing things differently. Once we started doing things differently, these are what the results are, which could be like, this is the nexus, you know, this is like the strategy that wins. And here are my, my, my customer success stories in a, in a business context. Right. But this kind of like, like it's almost like non-prescriptive, non-prescriptive, but if you want what we have, then I can show you the playbooks to get that. Um, and then, and particularly that messaging around like what, what it feels like to be in the problem. You know what I mean? Like that is extremely compelling on an emotional level to people. Um, and it does more than anything to inspire change in action. One of the examples of messages you will not see from sobriety groups when they're you know, trying to attract people to, to join is you won't see them just pitching the point B like we talked about earlier. You won't see them saying like a, a, a testimonial quote. You won't see it saying uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Anonymous changed my life. My wife came back to me. My career's back on track. My kids are talking to me again. And it's because the group of people that that group is relevant for isn't at that psychological state yet. What you'll see is a story that invokes self-discovery, just like you've been talking about, which is more along the lines of it started with just a drink every weekend that led to a drink every night. Before I knew it, I couldn't even relax at night without three to five scotches and the foundation of my relationship with my significant other started to crumble. Now, somebody who has not yet joined a sobriety group, but should, might read that part, that second you know, testimonial quote, and it will make their heart sink, but in a good way. And it's because you've told a compelling before story, the point A, that they can see themselves in. Mm -hmm. So really the principle behind this technique is, can your buyer see themselves in the story that you're telling them? And if they can't, it's probably going over their heads. And that's, you know, this is just another way of saying that principle. We've said this a lot here at Gong, both internally and kind of externally out to the world. This is worth screenshotting. Um, if you're going to be in a go-to-market career for, you know, years or your entire career, it's worth coming back to this quote every three months or so and just kind of meditating on it. If your story describes their problem better than they can describe it themselves, they will automatically assume you have the best solution. So the process is automatic. Yeah, and the thing I, I can't emphasize enough, like this this, this pitch is more around how people feel about it, right? Like it, it's not even like what they're doing. Uh, and I get so many prospecting emails. It's like, you know, Kyle is, is the head of an ailment at Drift. You must be concerned about getting ramps to quota quickly during onboarding and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, yes, I'm, I of course, that's like my what my job is. And, and yes, that's a part of it. But like, if somebody were to were to hit me with a message, that's like, um, it, it's like, hey, Kyle, you know, like, you, your team is gonna double over the course of the next two years, and I'm guessing like you're afraid about how you are gonna keep up with the pace of the business. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, just yeah. that kind of messaging, I'd be like, I'd get that, right? Like, if I'm selling to like, there, there's all kinds of stuff in sales and in in management that. Uh, that people feel it, they don't talk about, you know what I mean? So like the, the key to this is like bringing up the stuff that no one wants to talk about on an emotional level. I can't emphasize enough. That's what makes this resonate. And that's how you have like one incisive sentence that gets people attention more than anything else, like any full email, any hour conversation. Um, that's the key to this. Mm. Okay. That leads us to number four. So we've gone, you, 
you've walked your buyer through a few different steps. You've introduced a nexus, which is a new way of looking at the world. You've introduced some threats that are some trends that threaten their status quo, which spring from your nexus. And now you've told a story. So mm -hmm. now your buyer is at a heightened pink or peak to want to solve this. And it's really tempted to immediately jump into a product demo or a sales presentation and just spew off how you can solve it. A better way before you get to that point is to tell a before and after customer story and then immediately or use that to pivot into your product demo or your sales presentation. And the key here is you want both before and after. Because if all you do is tell an after customer story, it's probably not gonna resonate quite as much because after results or outcomes or you know these measurable results that are so common in customer stories do not resonate unless they land on the context you've built with the before part. And it doesn't even have to be complicated, especially if you've uh, executed these first few steps to your narrative really well. It's as simple as the slide we're looking at here, which is just an example of a gone customer story. But Kyle, do you have any additional thoughts to add about telling a customer story before you pivot into actually selling? No, I think it's it's great. I think the key to this is like just noticing that the numbers have to come after the emotional appeal. Yes. Um, and that that's just how people's brains work, right? Like we, everybody makes decisions with like their inner brain, their emotional part, and then they ask like their outer brain or their neocortex for permission. So it's like, hey, I want to do this. Like, you know, rational brain, is it cool? Like, can I go ahead and do this? And so if you don't have the buy-in on the emotional stamp, like this is basically giving people permission to go do something. You're right. Like they're going to want to see the demo, but it's like no one wants to go to their boss and ask for budget just based on a gut feeling. Like that's not how business people work. It's not that's not going to fly in any any company. So it's like, look, I want this for for an emotional region. Like give me some air cover to go ask for this without feeling like, you know, like I'm yes. feeble minded. You know what it's I mean? Justification. Yep. So numbers have to come after the emotional appeal. But I think this is awesome. Yep. And once you wrap it up, it is so natural to be able to finally pivot into your product. Right. All right. So we are running close on time here. We've got about 11 minutes. My guess is that we're not going to be able to do any Q&A at the end of this unless we totally skip the next technique, which is super social proof. Um, I don't know, Kyle, what do you think? Should we should we open it up to Q&A and, you know, kind of buzz through or should we? Let's hit think? like let's let's just quick hit this and then get some questions. Okay. I'd love to hear from the crowd. So super social proof is bombarding the customer with relevant resonant social proof. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick example. We'll do some quick Q&A at the end. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes. But let's pretend we're selling to a MarTech company. Here's how weak social proof would come across. You name drop these three logos. Only one of those is even semi-relevant, which is Oracle. They don't care about Walmart or Fidelity because it's not another MarTech company. It almost has a counter effect. They say you're serving different customers. Here's what decent social proof looks like. And this is, you do this like at the end of your demo, uh, ideally. Uh, we work with Marketo, Oracle, and HubSpot. Good, but not great, okay? You're talking about relevant logos that match your buyer, uh, but it's only three of them. Here's what a superstar salesperson uh, would do. They would bring up the MarTech landscape that we've, you know, kind of referenced a couple times. They would circle all of the MarTech companies that are current customers, and they would say, these are all the companies in your space that we can currently work with. There's 17 of them. That number is up from just four a couple years ago. In other words, people in your tribe are bandwagoning onto our solution. And that sort of bandwagoning effect is what you want to go for here. Talking about three customer logos that match their situation is good. Talking about a bandwagon or a trend in their marketplace is much better. So yeah. that's that's the end of that technique. Kyle, do you have any, you know, like quick insight or color to add to that one? Yeah, this just it makes me think of loss aversion again. Like that's just such, such heavy FOMO, you know, like you're about to get dusted by everybody you compete with. Um, you know, like, Hey, if you don't want it at the time, you don't have the time, but if, you know, everyone else seems to have it right. Like I'm like, okay, fine. I'll take the demo. You know? The other thing I think about this, when I think about social proof is like, um, that I feel like there's this old marketing technique where if you want a certain target group to buy your product, show the people they aspire to be using it. Right. And mm -hmm. I, and I always think of like, 
like like look at like Axe body spray commercials, and it's always like college kids like getting girls, <laughs> which is why only sixteen year olds buy Axe body spray, you know. So like like it's like kids in high school think that's what it's going to be like in college, so they start wearing Axe now, right? So Hilarious. use <laughs> use companies that are like just in front of the company you're pitching to not so far in front that they're like, well, I don't care if you work with them. They are nothing like me. They're way out there and I'm here, you know, show them who they want to be in the next year. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and show, tell that story is going to resonate more than like your biggest name that everyone's going to recognize, but no one's going to relate to. Yep. Well, I think we're ready for that prize. I promised at the end, Good. I'm going to skip through a lot of the buildup slides to get there, which pains me a little bit as a product marketer. But to get the slide deck we're talking about, the deck that we use at Gong that incorporates all of these principles, uh, you'll get a free copy if you go to gong.io slash deck. So go there right now, gong.io slash deck, and you schedule a demo. Once you schedule that demo, on the other side, you'll see a page like this. It's a members only private access page where you can click that purple button and download the deck and you'll be able to see how we at Gong incorporate all of those principles into our sales narratives. That's just one example that we use. Um, we're only keep access to that closes after the 100th person, person signs up, person, person. God, I'm tripping over my words today. That's not the first time. So before we take Q&A, go over to gong.io slash deck. Do that now, schedule your demo, you'll have access. And I think we've got like three, oh, we've got like four or five minutes for some Q&A. We made some good time on those last few slides. That was punchy. Yeah, banged it out. All right, so I'm gonna go through these questions. We have a ton of them. So let's try to tackle some of these. All right. If we're already a Gong customer, do we still need to fill out the demo form? Do it anyway, we'll just, um, you know, we'll just direct our sales development team to not book the demo, but you'll get the, you'll schedule it. You can, we'll, we'll, we'll get you hooked up. Go through the process though. We're gonna, let's see, there's a, oh man, these are hard to sort through. There's so many. What was the name of the book that Kyle mentioned right at the beginning? Kyle, do you remember that one? Uh, Sapiens, I think was the first one I mentioned. That's the one about, um, there's, there's a lot of things in there, but at the beginning they talk about Dunbar's number and how, humans um believe in things that aren't true to the for cooperation beyond 150 numbers 150 members um yep. i think that was it yeah yeah there's another one which was thinking fast and slow that you mentioned yep. too okay so here's a question we were always told to never sell on fear and scare tactics and it seems like that's what you guys are suggesting so i want to make a point um that we kind of glossed over the way you do this is you introduce a threat to their status quo. It's an external trend though. So you're, and when it's an external trend, now your buyer can quote unquote blame that external trend and they don't have to blame themselves that the status quo is no longer viable, which could be a really delicate message to do. So you yeah. actually should sell on fear, but you should do it in the right way. Okay, there's a there's right in theory and then there's wrong execution, which is, you know, comes across as scare tactics. But if you're educating the buyer about what the future could look like if they're not taking advantage of XYZ right now, that's a little bit different. I would argue you're not selling on fear. You are selling on loss aversion, but it's an educational approach. Yeah, I think the key is the the thing you're using to inspire that that concern or fear needs to be like external and like independently verifiable and like not created by your company. Yes. Right? It's, yes. it's something that is just happening independent of you and me and everything else. And I didn't make it, you know what I mean? But this is, it's like you're, you're surfing on a tidal wave of change that you literally have nothing to do with. And it's like, we can either like ride it or get blown over by it, you know, and, and we're riding it and this is what it's like. It's a great ride. Yeah. So that that's how I would differentiate that from, you know, stuff like, hey, you guys got to sign up now or, you know, you're not going to get into onboarding by the end of the month or whatever, like weird things we do to drive urgency at the end of a month or a quarter. Yep. 
All right, I think that is all we have time for. So I wanna say thank you to two different groups of people. First of all, Kyle, thank you so much for taking a full hour out of your day and not just the hour that we did today, but the several hours that you and I spent together to prepare this presentation. And the second group of people I would like to thank is of course, everybody who joined the webinar. I really hope you got value out of it. Um, if you have like additional questions, I don't know, Kyle, if you're up for it, but feel free to tag said, us yeah, on LinkedIn or just- uh, Message me on LinkedIn if you guys have questions that you didn't get answered or you know want to talk about cool books or how to create narratives I'm, I'm i love it so hit me up please yeah one final message that i would like to say is that there seems to be a little bit of confusion in the deck that i suggested you go fill out a demo request form to download a few people have asked um they're, they're confused that it's not the same deck we talked about today like the webinar deck that you and i just ran through that's not what I'm promising. This deck will be sent out via email either later today or tomorrow. The deck that I'm talking about, if you go to gong.io slash deck, um, is an actual sales deck we use at Gong that incorporates all of these techniques. So it's not the deck we're talking about here. Um, it's I think it's an eight or nine slide deck that starts with a nexus. Uh, introduces a threat to the status quo and goes through most of the principles we talked here. So go do that right now. Thank you so much for joining everyone from Kyle to everybody in the audience. And hopefully we'll, we, we will see you in our next webinar, which will probably be in a month or two. Thank you guys. And thank you, Chris. This has been awesome.